stellar parallax and stellar aberration video here. So prerequisite information, these measurements are done in arc seconds. And to go over what that means is if you were to take a protractor, look at the distance between one and two degrees. And if you were to break that up into 60 sections, you could say that each one of those seconds sections is an arc minute. And if you break each minute into 60 seconds, you can say that that's one arc second. So you can effectively break down a degree to one 3,600th of a degree. So that's the baseline for what we're going to be talking about here for how the measurements work. So when they measure something in the sky in arc seconds, what they're talking about is how, 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 how far it's moved in degrees in the sky, right? And they, they time that and they, and they come up with how fast it moves, right? Essentially. Okay, so, so when you Google stellar parallax, you'll see a lot of diagrams that look like this. They all represent, um, you know, some reasonable looking angles here. Nothing too crazy, right? So we got the Earth here. We got the Earth here. We got the astronomical unit. So the baseline of the triangle that they're going to establish is 93 million miles here. And then when they take the observation six months later, the, the Earth will be on the other side. So another 93 million miles. So they establish a 186 million mile triangle baseline there. All right. So let's look at, uh, at what they're saying here. So we'll, we'll go over this. Uh, we'll go over parallax and parsecs too because there's a proportional relationship too. So when you get into distances and stuff, that'll be, uh, that's included in this. So we'll just hit the whole gambit. So the distance of the the, dis the distance of an object can be determined by its parallax angle where the distance is proportional to the parallax angle. Specifically, the distance in parsecs is equal to one divided by the, the parallax angle in arc seconds. So one parsec is equivalent to approximately 3.26 light years. So an object of a parallax angle of one arc second would be a distance of one parsec, which, which is approximately 3.26 light years away, right? So that's the baseline relationship that they have. So let's see, the bigger star, closer, parsecs angle, parsec angles. Let's see, the distance and parsec angles. Okay. So this is just showing a the you know that same relationship when you plug it in with actual numbers and distances. So if you were to say something's 125 parsecs, you could get the relationship for the uh, for the angle, and you could get the the distance. Okay. All right. So the near let's see. So to show a practical application of that, right? So if you took I uh, I heard a story. Where the where Hubble was claimed to see something that was nine point or twelve point nine billion light years away, so if you convert that into light years, you can get the distance of seventy six sextillion miles. So you reverse engineer that, you get the distance in parsecs, and you can re, you can extrapolate the parsecs the parsec angle, right? So that angle, right? If this distance, if you were to uh, parallax it out the angle would be 0 0.0000253. So this is kind of just a role play. It's not really that meaningful. It's just uh, for funsies, right? But this is just kind of show you the scale and what they're working with here, right? All right. So again, if you look back at that triangle on those diagrams, they show some reasonable angles, right? Looks like some nice 45s, right? But really those angles, like so if you were to approach the distance of 76 sextillion miles, right? You're looking at, 89.9999999999, right? Like this is just insane, right? So you're looking at two parallel lines that converge at infinity. And that's that's what they don't really tell you that uh, about about these parallax angles. They make it appear like it's a reasonable calculation, but these are two parallel lines that converge at infinity. So right here at 0 0.0000000000003 degrees, so you know, somewhere out in infinity they converge, right? So none of these, none of this is meaningful or gives you any insights into anything. This is just a mathematical role play, right? So here's some links to um, to the sources, all this parsecs and all that, all that, some calculators so you can play around with it and kind of learn the system. All right. So quick recap here. So they say that an observation taken in June, I'm sorry, in January, to the star out here, it will be 
uh, and, and then six months later, that angle will show a relationship that they say is only caused by the motion of the Earth. Right. So what they don't show you is that the geocentric position with a stationary Earth in a rotating sky, an observation is made, the exact same angle is shown. And six months later, the exact same angle. So it doesn't, it's not, this observation isn't mutually exclusive, right? So the st heliocentric stellar parallax uses the, uh, what is it? The, uh, the small near and far, right? So if you use the small near and far system, the geocentric position is going to be identical in the prediction. So you would never, you wouldn't be able to th tell the difference, right? So here's where they get into the, uh, what I would consider their best mutually exclusive uh, evidence because it does show a mathematical relationship that, you know, is, is interesting to say the least, right? So let's take a look at the story here. So we're going to get into stellar aberration, right? So this is the idea that as the, as the um, Earth completes a circuit around the sun over the course of a year, that, the, that there will be an apparent shift in the stars. You can kind of think of it like a procession, um, but it's not, it's not really, it's an apparent shift that if you were to plot it over the course of the year, that's, it would look like a procession, but it's, they, they don't consider it like that. Right. So, <clears throat> but visually, if that helps you kind of understand it, that's what it would look like. Okay. So the, the equation given here is V over C equals theta. And they say that this theta angle is produced by the earth's velocity around the sun. And that movement creates a 20 arc second angle, this theta, oops, this theta angle. And that's only created by the, when you make the V 30 kilometers a second, which is what they say is the orbital velocity of earth around the sun. So it's like, wow, that's pretty, pretty interesting, right? Now this observation was done by Bradley in 1727. And, and, and there's some other uh, mutually exclusive evidence to include here too. So they also, say that due to the globular shape of the earth that the angles observed here are mutually exclusive to the shape of a globe too because in the northern hemisphere if you plot out that uh, that apparent shift it would make an arc procession across the sky in the northern hemisphere and if you were closer to the equator instead of seeing a, uh, a more of a circle you would see an ellipse so a more uh, a more curved and then at the equator, you would see a flat line if you were to plot that out, right? It would look like a flat line procession. All right. So all look, looks pretty, pretty damning for us, right? How do we explain it? Okay. Well, first of all, let's look at their, let's look at their claims and examine this in its entirety before we get into refutations. So this is the full steel man of the, of their, of the uh, heliocentric position, right? All right, so this is taken from Oliver Oliver Lee in 1942 in the Annals of uh, Dearborn Observatory or something like that. Anyway, so this is uh, this is how they explain parallax and negative parallax in the heliocentric model because there is negative parallax, which is which can't happen, right? It, it completely refutes the model if the if the if the, if the parallax that we observe is due to the motion of the Earth and the rotation of the Earth, it has to go in one direction. It can't go backwards. Okay, so when they look into the sky and they make these observations, well, they actually encounter instances where it goes, <laughs> the sky goes backwards. And so it doesn't give an agreement with the heliocentric model. So how does a young astronomer deal with such an observation that conflicts with uh, the heliocentric conception, right? So essentially, there is no mystery about negative parallaxes. At least for the first order quantities, they must be they must occur for one or more of the three following reasons. First, in the case of real parallax of a given star is small, the determined value of the parallax may have an error for which falls by a chance on the negative side of zero, so that the parallax comes out negative. This case has been exhaustively tr exhaustively treated by Sir Frank Dyson Watson of the Monthly Notices, uh, eighty six in page six hundred and eighty six. 
In this paper, the Astronomer Royal develops a specific formulae in the theory of probability applicable to the case in, in the form of the internal mean air of an extensive series of Greenwich parallax of stars having proper motions greater than 20 arc seconds per century. He derives the correction to all observed parallaxes and applies them. <laughs> so for a correction that he, for a formula that he used to correct something that uh, was giving a greater precession of more than 20 arc seconds per century, they uniformly apply this to all parallax observations now. So they can, so if you get a negative parallax observation, you can apply his formula to, to wrap it up as a statistical anomaly and count it up as a positive. Okay. But sometimes, sometimes the distance is greater than the, like, way outside of the error margin for statistical anomaly, and old Frank Dyson Watson's uh, formula isn't, isn't sufficient. So what shall the young astronomer do next? Second, when the parallax of the, of the close visual double stars ought, are sought photographically and on, on occasion, the negative parallax may be due to the uncertainty regarding the relative energy of the close star building up a composite image under varying conditions of seeing. This is, of course, especially true for double stars, which change position angle and distance during the time interval spanned by the plates so here he's saying that you know maybe it's a binary star system and in a binary star system you would have an irregular orbital period because of the gravitational influences at play you're going to have um a regular brightness because of that irregular orbit right they're going to be close together at certain times so during the period in which you're uh, making your observations during that time interval you're going to get you know varying observations and what you're seeing may just be an optical illusion due to the fact that it's a binary star system. So fret yacht, or fret yacht, fret not, young astronomer. It's just a, it's just another error. Go ahead and count it up as a binary uh, positive <laughs> parallax, right? Okay. So the third, the third explanation here. If all else fails, right? If it's not a, if it's not a binary, and if it's outside of your, your, your margin of error. What do you do? What's the handbook say? Three, when a distant star, whether bright or faint, is observed through a, through a scatter cluster or perhaps rather a layer of relatively, relatively near the faint stars, a negative parallax must be expected. Obviously, trigonomic conditions are just as valid for the distant stars, which uh, star with comparison stars that they are near to us, uh, that they are near to us as they are in the usual inverse situation. A large negative parallax may be just as real as the equal positive parallax, but it may just be, re <laughs> but it may be merely recognized that the positive parallax of a comparison star with respect to the distant star, which has been gotten it. In fact, a certain amount of direct information about the distant distances of fainter groups of stars as are used for comparison purposes is available in such a case a promising means existing to testing whether or not the distribution of ordinary neg or negative parallaxes bears any relation to the parallaxes of the comparison stars so they're saying that the reference stars that they use the the the, the fixed stars right they're saying maybe those moved oh, okay so maybe they're the the metric by which they're measuring moved so in the same regard, you know, if you were to, if you were saying, if you were traveling down a highway and you saw a mountain in the distance, right, and you're traveling down this highway for miles, and this this mountain's not changing size, right, but there's like you know some buildings off in the distance, and as you're getting, as you've been traveling for miles, those buildings are getting bigger, right? There's a tree, a couple of big trees or something in the background. You can see the, those are getting bigger, right? You've been traveling. Those are getting bigger. That mountain's staying the same, right? So you're like, okay, well, this mountain's huge and super far, right? It doesn't, doesn't move. So you start building a system around that. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you start getting measurements that conflict with that. So you're like, oh, well, maybe the mountain moved. <laughs> like, all right. And then you just maintain your system to, you know, when it agrees with you. It's just, all right. So, 
here's some potential explanations should these observations even exist, right? So for the geocentric position, the stars rotate every night. Um, so that, that could cause a potential yearly precession, right? Also, there, there could be a, um, an ether drift between the stars and the Earth. That would also, with, with Fresnel drag, that model would actually necessitate a drift. So that would be in alignment with, with the drift in between the stars and, and a stationary Earth, right? So also, the heliocentric model is contingent on C being a constant. We have a ton of experimental evidence that the speed of light is not constant. And as you go in, as you increase in altitude and take measurements, the speed of light changes, right? So if the velocity changes, you can't draw a proportional relationship off of a ratio using a constant that's not constant. So the fact that the speed of light changes proportional to the velocity of the observer completely contradicts their, uh, their model. Um, so they have to deny all of these experiments. They have to deny uh, Fazell, Arago, Mickelson Morley, uh, Sagnac, Mickelson Gale, like all these experiments where the speed of light changes, they have to say, they have to come up with some reason, some special case as to why it changes and make no allowances for anything else and say that when they look up at the sky, that the speed of light is definitely always the same no matter what. So... It's, a, it's really a framework that's uh, built to kind of reify itself. But further on the observations, you know, should they exist, right, to entertain the idea? Well, it just so happens that we experimentally, you know, see in, in an equivalence of what they call curved visual space or hyperbolic geometry. You can look into this uh, yourself in optics. It's... Uh, You'll find, you'll find that people are accepting curved visual space and curved uh, hyperbolic geometry as a valid way to represent optics, and you'll find people that are resisting it and sticking to the Euclidean methods. You know, So just look into it yourself and see what you come up with. But in the 40s, it was recognized by Carl, it was kind of pioneered by Carl Lundberg that optically speaking, we see in a near field and a far field, and he used Maxwell's equations, which represent a toroidal field, an inner and outer donut. So he described the, the inner and outer field as the radial change of a toroidal field. So using those equations, uh, the near and far field have different optical layers of optical compression. So the near field would have like an ellipsis or an ellipse um, uh, compression. And then the far field would have like a hyperbolic uh, compression. And then even in like the far, far field, there would be a different type of hyperbolic scaling, like some other curved hyperbola word right or something like that right so um you would have the, and this is all when you get into the optics here you would have let's see hyperbola curve yeah direct measurement here so right here so the curvature changes from the ecliptic in the near space uh to hyperbolic and far space and at very large distances you get parabolic right so you get different types of scaling uh, for the near and far field. And what that means is, is that there's different types of compression, like optical compression, right? So when you see a mountain in the distance and it's compressed down and you see it at a certain angular size, and then you see a, mount, or a building that's closer and that building is taller than the mountain, but you know that the mountain's way bigger than the building, right? It's like, oh, how does all that work? Well, it's dynamic angular scaling, and this is a result of that, right? This is represented by this, right? So they've come up with what's called the Wythe-Muller circle or the Wythe-Muller torus, which can be represented by, if you take two circles that intersect your left and right eye, do, do a 360 with them, uh, they'll make the toroid and that'll represent the near field and far field. So it'll create um, these kind of pockets here that, uh, that stretch out as they get further away from the observer. And that's how we see. So if you apply that optical geometry to the sky and so over a plane and you're looking at that and you're looking up at the sky, you're going to see in curved visual space. So this is what you would see on a plane with uh, hyperbolic geometry uh, for your optics. Now this closely looks like what we see on the so-called globe, but it's not quite there yet. So what's missing here is atmospheric conditions. When you apply those conditions, well, you get exactly what they see that what you see on the mutually exclusive globe, right? So all of these, angles relative to the latitude would be observed due to atmospheric conditions in curved visual space. 
So when you look at um, Stellarium, you'll get this. You see these um, this change here, this uh, this stretching. So same exact situation to explain it. Should those even exist? All right. So that's Stellar Aberration and Stellar Parallax. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed the video.